Welcome to the second week of our virtual online workshop on marriage spirituality. I'm delighted that you're back and I look forward to the topic we're going to be exploring today. We're going to look at who was Marcelin Champagne? And that question is a, a critical question because first of all, he was the founder of the Marist community. And in back of me is a picture of Lermitage, which was a house he built in 1825, uh, quite frankly, when he had no money and no one joining his congregation. Uh, and we'll see later that he was really a man who was quite daring. But this question of who is Marcelin Champagne is an important one uh, because some people have very strange ideas about who this man was. I'll give you one example. At Marist College a few years ago, uh, there was a group of prospective parents and students getting a tour of the campus and a student guide was leading them. And as they made their way over toward the Champagne dormitory and stood in front of the dormitory, the father of one of the prospective students said to the student guide, by the way, who's this guy Champagne? And without missing a beat, she said, you know, I'm really not sure, but he must have been a major donor if they named a building after him. Well, in some ways, Marcelin Champagne was a major donor to Marist College but in a way that's very different than what that young student guide might have imagined. So let's begin. And we'll begin by starting to look at some of the things that have shaped Marcelin Champagne's life, some of the formative experiences, and then we'll get down to the details, the nuts and bolts of the kinds of experience he had during the course of his life as he moved to the point where he was gonna found the Marist movement and the Marist community. The first thing I wanna say is that Marcelin was most of all an ordinary man who did ordinary things extraordinarily well and loved with an exceptional love. During the course of his life, I doubt many people would have thought he would have accomplished all that he did, but he was an ordinary man who did ordinary things extraordinarily well. To look at his life, I wanted to start by just giving some general ideas and then developing them a bit more. The first question is who was Marcelin Champagne? Well, he was a man whose life was bookended by two revolutions. He was born in 1789 at the onset of the French Revolution and died in 1840 after the revolution in France of 1830 and the uprising in the city of Lyon. During that period of his life, there was a great deal of tumult. He was born into a period of time of history not unlike our own. He saw the fall of the monarchy, the restoration of it, great tensions, the destruction of the educational system in France, the destruction of church structures. Secondly, he was influenced by three women, and I'll say more about that in a minute. His mother, his aunt Louise, and Mary of Nazareth. Thirdly, you need to remember he was both a dreamer and a doer. He was able to accomplish the things he imagined. He had tremendous energy, was willing to work hard, expected those around him to do the same. We could say he was passionate, zealous, someone who defied the naysayers. His life then also was marked by compassion and mercy. If you're looking for two virtues that mark uh, Marcelin Champagne and his spirituality, those are the two virtues, compassion and mercy. Now, his spirituality also lies at the foundation of Marist education and at the heart of any Marist school or any Marist project is the person of Marcelin Champagne. Uh, brother Francois, who was an early brother, often prayed to become a living portrait of Marcelin. And in the course of our own mission as Marist, we try to imitate his zeal, his passion, his ability to defy the naysayers, his mercy and his compassion. And he was very clear that love is the key to our approach to education and to evangelizations. If you ask Maris what they were meant to do, our task is to help young people fall in love with God. Now, Marcelin was born, as I mentioned, at the onset of the French Revolution in the southeast area of France, around Lyon. And this was an area that uh, was very rich in spirituality. It was an area where there was a great deal of devotion to Mary, the mother of Jesus. St. John Regis was a local saint who was revered by people. There were pilgrimages to a shrine that had been established in his honor. And in that area, in the southeast corner of France, a lot of his activities centered around the major city of Lyon and the two smaller cities or villages of saint Etienne and saint Chamon. So remember that Marcelin Champagne lived most of his life within that small 
tract of land, made some occasional trips to Paris, but he was not a person who traveled a great deal beyond the area in which he was born. Now, there were certain people who shaped Marcelin's life. First of all, his father had a tremendous influence on him. His father was a local government official after the revolution. One thing I want to be crystal clear about is that Marcel and Marcelin and his family really bought the themes of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity. And those kinds of qualities came into the Marist community very much. But his father was also a government official, unlike many other post-revolutionary officials. No one except one person died in the area where Marcelin's uh, father was the person in charge, whereas in other areas of France, you had people being guillotined on a regular basis. He was also a merchant, a local farmer, and he had some education, which was unusual for that period. Another powerful influence in Marcelin's life was his mother. She laid the foundation for his life of faith and his relationship with Mary of Nazareth. When his mother died, it was a very powerful experience in his own life and something that was a, I would say, a stepping stone or transformative experience. Other shapers were his Aunt Louise. Aunt Louise was the sister of Saint Joseph. She was the sister of Jean-Baptiste Champagne, who was the father of Marcelin. And at the time of the French Revolution, the new government closed all religious houses. So she had no place to live. She moved in with the Champagne family, with her brother and his family. She was someone who hated the revolution. Once when Marcelin said to her, Aunt Louise, what is the revolution? She said, it is nothing more than a beast. She was a woman though, who also helped with his religious formation. And her spirituality as a sister of St. Joseph really influenced a lot of his early spirituality. Another life shaper was Monsignor Moinet. He was a teacher, a brutal, brutal man. He gave a lesson in how not to treat and teach young children. Beat children up, uh, drank most of the time, and uh, in fact, many of the students, including Marcelin, only spent a day or two in his class and then quit school. It was such an unbearable experience for them. And that was one of the things you have to remember. The entire educational system in France collapsed with the revolution. And the people who were teachers were really what one government official referred to as the dregs of society. He referred to them as gluttons, drunkards, living immoral lives. Not somebody you wanna put in your resume, but. Uh, that was the description that was given. Marcelin was born in 1789, I mentioned. He was born in Marles in the village of La Rose. The family home is still there. And uh, he grew up uh, tending goats. He was a, really a, a goat merchant in his early life, uh, raising them and buying and selling them. And he had no interest at all in church affairs or, I mean, except for the normal kinds of things that Catholics would but no idea about becoming a priest or joining a religious order. And in 1804, a vocation director came through uh, the village of La Rose looking for uh, people who might be willing to go to the seminary. And that was because there were so few vocations at that time, the bishop had asked the seminary officials to go out on their vacation time and see if they could find some young people who might be interested in priesthood. Well, the parish priest was not very hopeful. They visited him first and finally he said, well, you might want to visit the Champagne family. When they got to Marcelin's house, no one was interested but Marcelin. And of course he was the person who wasn't prepared at all. He had no education. So his family were willing to let him entertain the idea and to try to get him some basic education. They sent him to study with his brother-in-law who was a certified teacher. And to make a long story short, after a year of studying with his brother-in-law, his brother-in-law said to Marcelin, think about doing something else with your life. He was not the best student. In 1804 also, his father died. He was 15 at the time. But despite uh, all the discouragement at the age of 16, which would have been very normal at that time, Marcelin entered the minor or the junior seminary. He struggled. There's no other way to put it. Uh, he struggled with his grades in the minor seminary and in the major seminary. Uh, at one point, he was asked to leave the seminary because of his grades and also his behavior. He was a little bit older than some of the other seminarians, and he and those about his age used to go to the tavern regularly. And this didn't really fit in with the image that the seminary officials had uh, for what a future priest should be like. But 
in any event, he later got back into the seminary, dedicated himself to study, was greatly respected by the faculty. And in 1810, when he was 20 years of age, his mother died. And this was a turning point for him, many people would say, because even though he had now taken his study seriously and was uh, beginning to develop some very good habits in his life, he put his attention to those areas much more powerfully in the years following the death of his mother. At 24, he entered the major seminary, and there he encountered Jean-Claude Corvey and Jean Collin, who and another group of seminarians who began to talk about the idea of forming what they called the Society of Mary. Corvey uh, had the original inspiration. Uh, he had been cured of a sight ailment at uh, the Shrine of Our Lady of Le Puy. And he said at that time, he received an inspiration where Mary said to him, I want you to found an order, a congregation, to re-evangelize Europe after the revolutionary movements. And I want it to be similar in structure to the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits except focused around Mary and to be called, rather than the Society of Jesus, the Society of Mary. So this group of seminarians discussed this idea throughout their seminary training. In 1816, 1817, there was really a year of, of action in that many things happened. On the 22nd of July, Marcelin was ordained. This is 22nd of July in 1816. The next day, he and this group that had the idea of the Society of Mary went to the small chapel at the Basilica of Fouvier in Lyon and made a commitment together to form the Society of Mary. If you ever visit the small chapel in, at the Grand Basilica at uh, Fouvier, you will see a, a sign there, or a plaque commemorating that fact. And on August the 12th, 1816, Marcelin was assigned as a parish priest in the village of Laval. And the story of his life as the founder of the Marist community began to unfold. Thanks so much for spending this time for this first video looking at the early years of the life of Marcelin Champagne. I'm going to take a pause here and uh, start up in a little while, but I wanted to point out that there are several readings this week that will be very helpful in terms of looking at more of the details of Marcelin's life and a little bit about his spirituality. So if you have the time, I encourage you to read those. And I look forward to joining you very shortly to pick up Marcelin's life as it begins to unfold in Lavala. Thank you. Mm -hmm.